It's not a French conspiracy to keep English speaking a speaker in the afternoon after lunch. So I, but I hope uh, I keep you awake. First of all, let me thank you, Virginie, and the department to make it possible for me to come to this place and to this conference uh, and uh, enjoy your hospitality and interaction over here. Thank you so much. Um, we had been listening um, since morning, and as the theme of the conference suggests, um, we are discussing the resistance and memories in terms of indentured workers over three centuries. Uh, my discipline is international relation, and I have been told by our interpreter that I should speak slowly. I'll try to do that within 25 minutes, yes. Uh, international relations and a history of international relations as well. And my take on this subject is from the point of view of interpreting history from the perspective of the present, because history is always an ongoing um, exercise in which the past and present keeps interacting. It just cannot be frozen to the context of the past itself. Um, though the past and its context remain important, and from this context, I'm going to share with you how the resistance and memory and identity played an important role in terms of interaction within India with what we call indentured worker. And I will just confine to that. It is understood that indentured workers themselves struggled all through when they were staying in different countries and there was very little reaction from India in terms of their struggle. Um, but as you know from 1834 when the indentured workers went to different countries uh, and when their plight and their recruitment processes became known to the public uh, at that point of time, as all of you know, India was a colonial country. But there was a non-state actor which was becoming very powerful in terms of influencing the state structure, and that was formation of Indian National Congress in 19, uh, 1885. From so 1885, you have a politically organized non-state actor which was taking on the state, which was a colonial state, to take policy issues uh, into several areas. Related to the indentured worker from the 1885 to up to um, 1905, one finds that this non-state actor in India largely tried to understand the process of indentured worker itself. And in that context, it promoted and it articulated and justified the migration of indentured worker to different countries because the condition, as you know, in India was bad because the incentive outside was good, but their abuse, their discomfort, and their discrimination was still not none to Indian people by then. It's only gradually when it became none that you start having responses and people in India joining the struggle and the resistance of indentured workers into different countries. The first contact in terms of knowing their difficulties and articulating that to Indian state was the contact of Mahatma Gandhi, Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi in South Africa, where in early 1890s, he established um, political organizations and started working to get equity for Indian people in South Africa with the others and joined their struggle locally. And he was instrumental in connecting and giving feedback to Indian National Congress, especially to two major player in that. One was Gandhi, the other was Gokhale. 
uh, no, uh, one was Gokhale and the other was Dada Bhai Nauroji. So these two people were being fed with information that though the indentured worker is good for India, which was articulated by uh, some of the Congress leader like Mahadev Govind uh, Rana Day from 1890 onwards. Uh, the Gandhi was saying, no, they don't have equity and they have discrimination and the Congress must ask the um, British government to get, give them equity and justice over here. So that, <clears throat> that was the first phase where there was an interaction with the diaspora and an appreciation of indentured workers in India. But indentured workers were suffering in their territory and therefore the, uh, gradually there was some articulation to oppose that. There were two commissions which were appointed during that, that time. One was John uh, Commission in 1873 and the other one uh, by Commerce in 1893. Both of them tried to understand the position of these indentured workers and communicate to Indian National Congress and the people who were, who were disturbed by abuse and discrimination that everything is all light in colony, there are minor lapses, there are aberrations, but everything will be settled and everything is under control, nothing to worry. But it was from 1905 to um, 1910 that you find that Indian people, Indian National Congress and Indian leaders join the resistance of indentured worker outside within India and they started working to correct the situation. And in this you find that um, the formative phase uh, started by appointing, uh, asking the colonial government to appoint a commission which was Sanderson report which came in 1909 and in that Sanderson report which the colonial government appointed it covered the global indentured diaspora, not just in one country or two countries, and also presented some of the findings in greater details. That, did, of course, the committee report was largely positive in terms of diaspora treatment, in terms of diaspora um, or indentured worker um, um, presence in different countries, but it, for the first time it gave to Indian nationalists a bigger idea of how many people, where are they, what kind of treatment and what kind of system they are facing and that, that gave them some material to work on that. And under that you find that uh, there are several delegations led by Annie Besant and some of the Indian nationalists were sent to some of these countries to find out and report to Indian National Congress as what is going on. And it is in this context that you find that um, they discovered that this is something wrong and they are going to work against this. 1910, they asked for self-governing status for India and in that they said the treatment to Indians in India and treatment to indentured workers who are Indian in other crown, uh, crown colonies should be the same and there should be no discrimination. So for the first time in 1910, you find that Indian National Congress linked indentured worker discrimination with discrimination that was being practiced by uh, British colonial government in India and that was largely that they, despite being the subject of British colonial government, they were not equated with the British or the other subject in crown colonies. 1912, um, the Indian, uh, the Imperial Legislative Council in which Indians were represented for the first time asked that indentured worker is not acceptable. And it said that this position of coolie for indentured worker outside is neither acceptable to indentured workers and this must stop because this coolitude or the coolie Kuli uh, status of Indians is demeaning, uh, unequal and discriminating for indentured worker as well as humiliating for India. 
and 1912 this imperial legislative council legislation um, um, resolution by indian national congress became a landmark intervention where from the inc took it on itself and congress took it on itself to end this indentured labor practice and to work for removing and abolishing discrimination faced by them and in a few years it became so competitive that Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Parsi, Christians, all of them started competing. That how, who takes the lead in getting this indentured worker recruitment removed. And it is in this, there was a competitive fight and con competitive move by different sections of um, Indian society. Uh, and the government then, the colonial government appointed a commission, MacNeil and Chamal Lal Commission, which again um, painted a positive picture and tried to remove some of the fear and opposition that was coming to that. But it was not acceptable and Annie Besant and many others again went to different colonies to map some of these practices which was reported as abuse. Uh, in 1915, um, the uh, INC, Indian National Congress, again passed a resolution in its, national, uh, in its annual assembly that this system must go and Congress must take it up without any delay, that this recruitment should stop and the discrimination must be addressed. 1917, again, Indian National Congress passed a resolution and moved to a legislative imperial council saying that by the end of 1917, this indentured worker practice must be removed and that the prime and the most important demand of Indian National Congress. Gandhi on the other hand said, we can't wait till the end of 1917. We must finish it by, I am giving the deadline of March 1917. If you don't do it, I will go on Satyagraha and fast. And therefore, the British government then decided to end the, this indentured recruitment system, despite all those reports and other things, by 20th of March, not even extended up to 30th of March. And the indentured recruitment system came to an end. And the Indian government then had joined this um, struggle to, uh, to bring it to a conclusion. But the consequences of that were that Endangered Indians from then onwards became Indian overseas. And it has this important policy implication that if they are Indian overseas, then whatever condition and discrimination and abuse that they are facing, if it is not acceptable, then we should try to uh, address that. And therefore, from 1917 onwards, you find that Indian National Congress moved after abolishing the indentured worker to remove the discrimination that they have. The, when this move was going on, there was entry of Jawaharlal Nehru by 1930. And in 1927, he had participated uh, in, a, uh, in a Brussels Congress of oppressed nationalities. And there, when he met other people of oppressed nationalities, Africans and others who were indentured workers and slaves, he decided that India as a country should not pursue singularly the oppression and discrimination of Indians, which Gandhi had done in South Africa. Gandhi largely represented Indian community. It's, it's uh, later on that he joined hand with the larger black community in terms of addressing the discrimination. But Nehru said from 1927, no. And the result was that 1930, when the Indian National Congress established its foreign wing, Nehru became in charge. And the struggle of all indentured workers or Indian overseas community was merged into the struggle of all the oppressed people. And that led to some setback on, on behalf of Indian initiative uh, in short term, in addressing the issues and discrimination of people of Indian origin. And even till independence, Nehru followed that policy. 
that all oppressed people struggle is India's struggle. He also followed the policy the Indian independence is not complete if all colonies are not independent. And therefore for Africa and other areas also, he said their struggle is part of the continuum of Indian struggle. So by making, by linking the Indian endangered worker oppression, uh, oppressive practices uh, linked with the larger community and all oppressed people, the indentured worker discrimination cause suffered a great deal. 1947, when India became independent, again Nehru followed the same policy. And he stated that um, all these indentured workers must um, recognize themselves as the citizen of the country where they are, and they must not seek any special support from India. Um, because they are of Indian origin, they should try and join hands with the local people in terms of liberating each country and should subjugate their interest to the local. In long term, it, be, it gave a confidence to the locals to assimilate and accommodate Indians, but in short term, they felt let down. They felt that India had abandoned them especially when they, ha they had competitive environment, especially in Caribbean, uh, where you had a large black community, which was lesser th in, in number, took over uh, um, uh, in terms of political power, in terms of leadership, because it got linked with uh, the black empowerment movement in USA. And many of these black empowered leader, uh, empowerment movement, like Marcus Garvey, and um, William Sylvester, uh, George Padmore from Caribbean, all of them had closer link with Europe and, and, and uh, with US black power movement. Whereas India under Nehru was for the larger oppressed community and therefore there was a sense of abandonment, uh, abandonment by, by India to these peoples. Uh, and in short term they suffered and they resisted um, this Indian move. But Nehru didn't budge from this. Of course, he was more interested in contrasting with the British policy um, in South Africa, which supported uh, apartheid, British policy in Rhodesia, which supported unilateral declaration of independence in 1965. And till 1990, all successive government, many of them a daughter and son um, and, and daughter's uh, son, they continue to follow Nehru policy. And therefore, you find that that policy continued till 1990, and in that, indentured workers and diaspora felt let down and isolated. Uh, though in, in long term, you find that their acceptability and their struggle to adjust within paid them dividend quite a bit and they are even today not seen by the host country uh, as the fifth column of India, as the, uh, as the one in which India has a special interest over the native. Um, the last phase is, um, is 1990, where the, all these diasporas um, who were indentured diaspora and also a, a, a sizable number of them in West Asia who went under similar condition in the 60s and 70s. Um, under contract work, um, they became uh, again part of India policy and this was what Rana Day says in 1890 that indenture must continue, it is good for India, good for indenture and the same in, uh, 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 no, so that was 1890 and now 1990 the policy was again reversed what Nehru had do uh, done and in this reversal there was a fast U-turn to link with diaspora actively. And then the diaspora registered this linkages again. In many countries, diaspora said, no, we don't want India. We are local. We are um, a member of this country. And so please keep away. You have abandoned us. We are happy. And now you are undergoing economic crisis. So you are interested in our money. And uh, we will not link. And the dialogue continued. And under that dialogue, which India started in early 90s, 
India is one of the world's fastest moving country in terms of diaspora linkages. In 15 years, it came out with policy program initiative where it links its 25 million people of Indian origin who have as much wealth as uh, which is supposed to be the equivalent of the GDP of India. And this linkage had gone so far that it immediately freed India from within two years from all the conditionality of World Bank and IMF when in mid 90s it switched from um, a state control economy to free market private sector led economy. And there are several program and policy that came. So I was just trying to see how over the years this uh, Indian policy had been linking with the diaspora discrimination and diaspora issues, their struggle over there. Uh, but, but theoretically, I would suggest, and my understanding that has developed as a student of international relation, that we have given too much of weightage to paint, and rightly so at a certain point of time probably, endangered as a victim syndrome, that indentured were victim and they were equivalent to slave and therefore they treated and that went on. What nobody noticed that indentured was also like what is the migration of contract labor which is happening, happening even today. And I find so much of similarity between indentured worker of that century and today, the body shopping agency recruitment of all the IT workers, you can call them IT coolies, um, to different countries. And they, did the, they do the same thing. They pay very low uh, and they hire very, um, you know, uh, ill-trained professional, but they, uh, but they are kept for work. They are not allowed to join others' work. They, they are called to sit on the bench and they are hired with the agency and under the body shopping. It's something that happened in the indentured worker. And today also, they are so much high in demand that several countries have opened their offices in Delhi to recruit as many IT workers, as many uh, engineers and doctors as possible. And they are not treated at par and with respect and equity even outside. So I think it continued. So it's, it's, it's time to look at uh, uh, at indentured worker to, to engage in the new narrative of history that they were professionals and there was a reason for them to be extremely successful that the French who had no colony um, uh, in, in who had very small colonies in uh, India, in Pondicherry and others, went into agreement with the Britain to supply indentured worker to most of its colonies. Dutch went into contact with British to supply indentured worker. It's a thing that is happening even today. Uh, countries after country entering into agreement with the body shoppers to supply IT coolies, to supply um, other um, trained, skilled people into different areas. So that's the one thing that, that becomes very clear. The second thing I would like to say why they were successful, because as you saw in the morning, they were first the Europeans, then the Japanese, then the Chinese, the, Indo the Vietnamese, the, the Sumatrans, all of them went as indentured worker to begin with, but they all failed. And why they failed, I think it's something that one needs to research. My own take is that the part, the part of India from where they went, agriculture, was very highly rated, as education and IT is very highly rated in India today. Everybody who wants to do anything in education goes to IT, goes to technical education. Those days, anybody who wants to grow in life used to go for agriculture and land. And there is a saying in Hindi, I will translate it for you, Uttam Kheti Madhyam Ban Nisat Chakri Vik Nidan, which means that the best profession in the world in those days, in the local saying, local value, system was agriculture. The second best is business. The third best is service, employment. And the fourth is begging. So when, under, yes, so when in the indentured workers uh, contract, there was a clause that if you are not paid your return ticket, you will, you will be paid a piece of the crown land. And that motivated them that they will become landowner. They will become agriculturists themselves. It's like becoming industrialist of today. It's becoming a corporate owner of today. 
and that made them devote the time and that made them to excel, excel in that area. I think I'll stop here only with this remark that we need to revisit indentured um, resistance, indentured recruitment and indentured history from the present time so that we get a new insight into that. Thank you.